Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. On the second Sunday of Lent, let us open our hearts to the Lord's consoling presence, eager to be filled with his grace and peace. Please silence all cell phones and electronic devices before we begin our liturgy. Please stand. Our opening hymn will be Save Your People. Genesis. God put Abraham to the test. He called to him, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son Isaac, your only one whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a holocaust on a height that I will point out to you. 
when they came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Then he reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the Lord's messenger called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Do not lay your hand on the boy, said the messenger. Do not do the least thing to him. I know now how devoted you are to God, since you did not withhold from me your own beloved son. As Abraham looked about, he spied a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he went and took the ram and offered it up as a holocaust in place of his son. Again the Lord's messenger called to Abraham from heaven and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you acted as you did in not withholding from me your beloved son, I will bless you abundantly and make your descendants as countless as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants shall take possession of the gates of their enemies, and in your descendants all the nations of the earth shall find blessing. All this because you obeyed my command. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be God. give us everything else along with him. Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? 
It is God who acquits us, who will condemn. Christ Jesus, it is who died, or rather, was raised, who also is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. Then a cloud came, passing a shadow over them. From the cloud came a voice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what they had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord From what my dad used to tell us, my grandmother, his mother, used to dabble in palm reading when she was younger. That's the kind of news that sort of makes your eyes bug out when you first hear it. To think of my sainted grandmother reading the lifeline and the, uh, the love line and whatever lines there are on the palm of your hand as a way of predicting the future. It's always been kind of hard for me to imagine, um, even more so again, because my grandmother, Dorothy Ingram, was always a faithful and very principled Catholic. And the church definitely frowns on the idea of anyone claiming to forecast the future by interpreting the lines on the palm of your hand, or the, the shape of tea leaves in the bottom of the cup, 
um, or what tarot cards happen to be laid out in front of someone um, in the parlor of, uh, of a fortune teller. Nevertheless, that's the story that my father told. And all of us, the grandkids, got a big kick out of the idea, no matter how true or untrue it may have been. One thing's for certain, though, if my grandmother did read an occasional poem, she wasn't alone by any means. In the sense that so many people, both young and old, go to all kinds of lengths to try to puzzle out their future, to get some sense, some clue as to what their future will be. Again, whether it's palm reading, or tea leaves, horoscopes, tarot cards, seances, mediums, there seem to be no end of gimmickry claiming to unlock for you what tomorrow is going to bring. And I suppose it shouldn't come as any big surprise that those things are so enormously popular uh, even in a culture, even in a society that prides itself on being so technologically advanced, uh, so scientifically oriented. But the fact remains that as human beings, most of us feel um, a gnawing sense of um, insecurity about the future. We want desperately to know what's coming next. Um, just as human beings, we're built um, to want to understand. We have a deep-seated desire to understand. And that hunger certainly extends to our hunger for knowledge about the future, our desire to understand what's coming next. So even if, for example, I put no faith personally in the horoscope, I do look at it every now and then out of curiosity. <laughs> and if someone were to walk up to me today and say, Father Brian, let me tell you what is going to be happening in your future in the next few weeks or months or years. I might be skeptical, but at the same time, I'd probably want to pull up a chair and listen. That desire, as I said, to know is one of our most ravenous appetites. And it's the rare person whose hunger for knowledge doesn't include all the questions and uncertainties that surround whatever lies ahead. Our future is a huge question mark. This past year has made that fact uh, all the more abundantly clear. And the not knowing can be very hard to live with. Actually, though, I should correct myself, because our future is not entirely unknown. Granted, there's no way of predicting in advance how well you might do if you were, say, a high school student on the next chemistry exam, or whether your marriage will survive the crisis you and your spouse are struggling through, or if you'll keep your job, or when you'll finally grab that coveted vaccine appointment that you've been working at so hard for weeks now, or whether your daughter's cancer was caught in time. But our ultimate future is already known. Jesus reveals it plainly on the mountaintop in today's dramatic and beautiful gospel. <clears throat> St. Mark tells us that the Lord brought with him three of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John and essentially showed to them his future with his face 
dazzling as the sun, and his clothing as white as light. Jesus showed his friends the indescribable glory that he would reclaim after passing through death and into risen life. Peter, James, and John are being given a glimpse, albeit a very fleeting one, of Easter, even before their master has arrived at Good Friday and the horror of the cross. There are no tea leaves, no horoscopes, no seance, and certainly no palm reading, but rather an ecstatic sneak preview of what is yet to come, a glimpse not only of Jesus' future, but of ours as well. And that's what I mean by saying our destiny is not just a huge question mark. We're promised the same unimaginable glory that we see in Jesus, transfigured there atop Mount Tabor. Our faces as dazzling as the sun. Our baptism, whether it was 13 years ago or 33 or 83 years ago, our baptism has swept each and every one of us into the extraordinary mystery that Jesus has already accomplished. The journey from darkness into light, from neediness to wholeness, from death into the bosom of unending life. That is our future, to share in Jesus' resurrection, our fragile bodies utterly transfigured, every tear wiped away. As John the Evangelist would say, we shall become like him. And the him that we see in today's story is glorious, beautiful, perfect, beyond what even words could describe and begin to capture. Yes, there may be many visits to Jerusalem, before our journey is completed, and many, many heavy crosses that we have to shoulder. But there's no reason to be afraid, because our future is assured. Forward to the 
resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. From the moment of our baptism, we too are beloved children of our Heavenly Father. Let us lift up our prayers with deepening confidence. Our response will be, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the Church throughout the world, and for those preparing to be baptized this Easter, may the spiritual discipline of Lent guide us to a deeper intimacy with Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, mercy hear our prayer. prayer. That through the intercession of St. Lawrence, our parish family will grow in its capacity to love the Lord with all our hearts and to love one another as we do ourselves. We pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That God's blessing will rest upon all who are working so strenuously and often at great personal risk to defeat the coronavirus. We pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our second grade children who are receiving the gift of the Lord's forgiveness sacramentally for the first time, and for those who wish to return to the sacrament this Lent, we pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the thousands of men, women, and children whose lives will be touched by our generosity, in the Catholic Ministries Appeal, we pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Julia Flores and all whose lives are heavily burdened, especially the sick, the isolated, and the grieving. For Father Tom and those who are recovering from illness, surgery, or addiction, we pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That Donald Lang and all our sisters and brothers who have died, including the half million souls who have been lost to the COVID-19 pandemic in our country alone, will be welcomed with gladness into the halls of the heavenly banquet. We pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pause to remember Mary Backman. Claire Piro, Anna Frankowitz, Frank Napoli, and all our parishioners as we continue our worship, and take a quiet moment to recall our personal needs. For these, we pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, hear our prayers. Transfigure our lives by the power of your Spirit, and form us more perfectly in the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice in your hands, the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May this sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, cleanse us of our faults and sanctify your faithful in body and mind for the celebration of the Paschal festivities. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks together to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For after he had told the disciples of his coming death, on the holy mountain he manifested to them his glory, to show, even by the testimony of the law and the prophets, that the passion leads to the glory of the resurrection. And so with the powers of heaven we worship you constantly on earth, and before your majesty without end we acclaim. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and draw us to the resurrection until you come. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our surest peace. We celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead, and looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim, 
who reconciles to you the whole human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those who unite to yourself by the sacrifice of your Son, and grant it by the power of the Holy Spirit, as they partake of this one bread and one chalice, they may be gathered into one body in Christ, who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in communion of mind and heart, together with Francis our Pope and John our Bishop. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among the saints in the halls of heaven, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, St. Lawrence, and all the saints, and with our departed brothers and sisters, whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then freed at last from the wound of corruption, and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Broken with him in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I give you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of the Church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus be always with you. And with your spirit.
Let us stand now and pray. As we receive these glorious mysteries, we make thanksgiving to you, O Lord, for allowing us, <clears throat> while still on earth, to be partakers even now of the things of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just ask you to be seated for a moment. If you were listening really carefully, and I hope you were, um, during the prayer of the faithful, you heard Deacon Patrick praying for the thousands of men and women and children right here on Long Island who will hopefully be benefiting from uh, the gifts given to this year's Catholic Ministries of Heal. Um, so before uh, Cindy offers the, the other announcements for today, um, just a word that we officially kick off the 2021 appeal as of this weekend. Um, as you know, this is something that we do every year. Um, it's really the very best strategy that the diocese has for supporting the literally dozens of programs uh, that help keep the church moving forward here in our diocese. So that would be both Nassau and Suffolk counties, all 133 parishes. Um, all of those parishes are asked to contribute to this effort, including our own. Um, and the monies that are raised literally are going to support uh, things as diverse as Catholic Charities, um, a place like Talbot House, which offers recovery from addiction, um, affordable housing, for veterans and for seniors, um, helps uh, support the seminary and the education of deacons and priests. Uh, many different aspects of ministerial life here on Long Island really have their sustenance, at least financially speaking, because of the CMA, the Catholic Ministries of Heal. Um, over 600,000 people are very directly helped by the gifts that we give each year. And here at St. Lawrence, um, our parishioners have been extraordinarily generous. Um, we've met our goal every year for as many years as I can remember, even last year, uh, where people's financial situations were, um, in many cases, precarious, um, if not really in shambles. Um, we still exceeded our goal by over $2,600. Um, so I'd like to invite you to please participate in the appeal this year. Doing so is very, very simple. Um, there are donation pamphlets near the doors, on the tables near the doors. Um, there's also a phone number and an email address, a website rather, that you can contact uh, just by looking in today's bulletin. This will be a project for really the entirety of the year that's remaining. Um, so we do have time, of course, but um, during this Lenten season, where we're encouraged to practice almsgiving and charity um, in a most um, kind of self-sacrificing way, um, it really becomes a perfect opportunity to contribute to something that directly helps the lives of so many. So thank you for prayerfully considering the gift to this year's appeal. Cindy. Our Knights of Columbus are sponsoring a blood drive tomorrow in the school gym. Register by phone if you can, using the number on the flyers by the doors or on the website. Walk-ins will be accepted so long as there is no overcrowding. Once again this year, we invite you to take a little black book of daily meditations for Lent. You'll find them on the tables around the church. The Stations of the Cross are prayed communally on the Fridays of Lent at 7 p.m. We've also recorded two versions of the Stations for our YouTube channel, one for adults and another specially geared toward children. As you've been hearing, a beautiful seven-part video series called The Search is available to all our parishioners simply by going to formed.org. It will also be shown on the Catholic Faith Network, 
Optimum Channel 29. Here at St. Lawrence, we will be hosting virtual meetings on Zoom to discuss the episodes on the four Saturdays of March at 11 a.m. Please contact the Office of Faith Formation to register for these virtual discussion groups. Another way to enter more deeply into the sacred season is by participating in a nationwide prayer campaign for the unborn called 40 Days for Life. Details can be found in today's bulletin. Kindly leave your weekly offering in one of the baskets on the tables by the doors. Please be sure to take a copy of the bulletin as you leave. Wash or sanitize your hands at the earliest, earliest opportunity and enjoy the rest of the weekend. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Glorify the Lord by your life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Have a wonderful weekend. Our processional hymn will be, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. <laughs> 